yes guys so today's session we are going to discuss about something called as index 33 now this is a very peculiar standard because index 33 deals with something called as earnings per share now when i call about this concept of earnings per share the first thing that i want to bring it out is that this standard is purely a presentation and disclosure standard you don't recognize earnings per share now earlier whatever asset related standards or liabilities related standards that we have discussed we were always talking about the point of recognition and measurement here you don't have recognition at all because i don't recognize eps eps is not an asset or a liability or an debit or a credit to be recognized in my books of accounts so it's a purely a presentation and a disclosure related standard so all that you do is that an eps of a particular company is so and so is what i presented and the way I've computed it, the way I've calculated this part of EPS, I will disclose it as a part of my notes to accounts. In simple, this is all that we do. Now, why is the standard so important? Then? I'll tell you one simple logic that today, when you see your stock markets are, you know, either on a bear trend, sometimes on a, on a bullish trend, you find that stock market immediately after the COVID news has broken out, it came down to 7,500, your NSE, and today you see it at 15,000 plus. So if you look at the stock markets have actually doubled in the last eight to 10 months, or I put it as 10 months. In the last 10 months, the entire stock markets have actually doubled. So that means you need to understand that there is a certain movement in the stock prices. Now, why is this certain movement in the stock prices arising? Your Sensex, or oh, I'm not talking about an SFM class at all. I'm purely talking about financial reporting. And I'm trying to emphasize upon the importance of EPS. Then. Your entire stock market revolves around the principle of P into EPS is equal to market price per share. So any market price per share either derived in a NSE or a BSE is calculated using the same formula of EPS into P. Now generally you find this trend happening that whenever a quarterly results of a listed company are out, you find that there's a huge volatility as far as the stock market movement is concerned. Let's say ICICA Bank has, re has released its quarterly results or Q3 results on a particular day. Now, any Q3 result or any quarter result should be declared within 40 days from the end of that quarter, according to SEBI. That is a listing agreement of SEBI. So 40 days in the sense, let's say 31st, Jan uh, 31st December is your close of Q Q3. That means the results will be declared by 10th of February. So when I'm declaring the results on 10th of Feb, what really happens is it is the EPS which changes because your earnings per share is based on your past quarter result. So that is your result from October to December. That is a Q3 and this Q3 result, whenever it fluctuates, wherever the EPS goes up or the EPS goes down, the same movement is actually reflected even on the price of the share. Yes, I am assuming that the P is constant, which is not right because P keeps moving. But to explain the significance of EPS, I'm assuming that the P is constant. You remember diminishing marginal utility, everything else remaining constant. Now I'm only asking you to keep one P constant. So I think my explanation is justified. So EPS is so important that every quarter results are out. You find that the stock market moves around. The stock market is moving because of the multiplier of EPS. Because your market price per share in a stock market is derived by multiplication of EPS into P. So this simple formula of market price per share actually gives a lot of emphasis on the EPS as well. Though on today's day markets are more revolving around the PE movement of a company, but EPS is also a significant metric in measuring the market price per share. So there we understand that EPS is important. What else, what else makes EPS so important? EPS is also important to measure the progress of the company compared to the previous year. Now, let's say, for example, I have written a particular mock test and I've scored 75. Now you tell me good or bad. How do I know whether good or bad? How much is it out of? Out of it is out of 100. Good. It is out of 200. Bad. Out of 100. Okay, good. Last time I got 90. Now good or bad? So always there is a comparison. Let's say the last time I got 60, now I got 75. Now good or bad? Good. Okay, fine. The classroom average is 95. Now good or bad? 
right so that means one single metric by itself you cannot declare whether the results are proven to be good or bad for example 50 in ca is difficult 50 in the same 10th class is not so difficult so that means the comparison also should be on par so it should always be between two peers so eps creates a single platform or a metric to be compared i walked for one kilometer what are you talking i walked for one mile which is more now they are not comparable terms so a mile has to be converted into a kilometer to prove that a mile is more than a kilometer and therefore one mile is greater so a person who actually walked for one mile is more than the person who just walked for one kilometer so how do you know about this that means they are bringing two particular individuals achievements on a single scale of measurement to prove who and which person has actually fared better such single metric is called as eps as far as your companies are concerned what is eps an earnings per share which is calculated on a periodic basis if it's a listed enterprise i normally calculate on a quarterly basis if it is an unlisted enterprise then i generally calculate it on an annual basis now this way whenever i talk about eps eps is not only important for determining market price per share but it also helping comparison comparison between what comparison with, with my past performance or benchmarking with my competitors i can try to identify whether i am performing fairly well or not clear so eps is becoming such an important metric now when i talk about eps is so important so important so important now fundamentally where did i even touch about year in days 33 i'm just emphasizing upon the importance of eps but let us look at what eps talks about this standard in days 33 particularly divides eps to be presented and disclosed into two parts that means each enterprise has to disclose two eps first eps is called as basic eps second eps is called as diluted eps these are the two eps's which should be presented and disclosed as a part of your financial statements now what is this basic eps what is this diluted eps is the entire discussion that we'll be going about the first part of our lecture we'll only be discussing about basic eps the next part of our lecture we will be discussing about diluted eps which is one of the most brilliant concepts that can ever be produced so what is this basic eps and diluted eps actually talking about let's get into the concept So like I told you, the movement of share prices is based on your EPS, your comparison with previous year and your comparison with industry benchmarks. Everything is possible only with the EPS. And like I told you, EPS is of two parts, basic EPS as well as your diluted EPS. First, let's concentrate upon basic EPS and look at the formula that he gives. Basic EPS or in short, you call it as BEPS is computed by using a formula of PAES by WNES. In short, I call it as pace by veins. Okay, so pace by veins. What is pace? Profits available for distribution to equity shareholders. And veins is nothing but weighted average number of equity shares. Saying pace is profits available to equity shareholders, and veins is nothing but weighted average number of equity shares. First. Before we get into the complex computation, let me concentrate first of all on what is this PAS and what is this WNES. Forget about basic EPS for a second. Let's try to concentrate upon how to derive this numerator and how to derive this part of denominator. How do I calculate numerator? How do I calculate denominator? So let's break it up. First, I will take up take up PAS that is your numerator part. Then I will come to your denominator. That is your weighted average number of equity shares. Pace is one of the most easiest. Veins is a slightly tricky one. Slightly tricky. I'm not saying very tricky, but slightly tricky. So let's start with the first part. That is the numerator part. How do I calculate this numerator? Profits available to equity shareholders. Now, what is the amount of profit available to equity shareholders? The profit available to equity shareholders for payment of dividend or distribution of dividend is such kind of profit which is after payment of interest, after payment of tax and after payment of preference dividend. So after discharging the liability of preference dividend to the preference shareholders, 
balance profits if any they are left out then i will get something called as profits available to equity shareholder so in a simple formula i can put it up like this profit as a profit after tax as per your pnl reduced by the amount of preference dividend which is not debited to the pnl because it is a appropriation of profit should be considered as my profits available to equity shareholders so i'll repeat again i'm saying profits after tax minus preference dividend is equal to profits available to equity shareholders now profit after tax how to determine i leave it to you because you have concepts of accrual you have concepts of matching you have concept of conservatism all these principles applied into your uh, you know in preparation of your statement of profitability you have multiple standards which will talk about it revenue recognition standard deals with india's 115 borrowing cost dealing with india's 23 your for your, your forex gain or loss deal, dealt by india's 21 you have impairment dealt by india's 36 you have depreciation and amortization dealt under india's 16 and india's 38 so many components of pnl which which we have already dealt with under multiple other standards taking that into consideration i derive at something called as profit after tax after applying your current tax and your deferred tax which is a tax expense as per india's 12 so even that also considered i will get profit after tax such profit after tax i am not going to discuss any further in this particular standard because multiple standards are involved into identifying this figure of profit after tax reduced by preference dividend now this reduction of preference dividend there are two types of preference dividend like we always know one is called as cumulative preference shares and second one is called as non cumulative preference shares now what is the significance of both of them cumulative preference share means whether you pay a particular preference dividend in the current year or not such amount of dividend is payable in the subsequent years whenever the company earns sufficient profit for example the company made loss in the current year and the company is unable to pay such amount of dividend such cumulative preference dividend will be accumulated to the subsequent year and will be paid up whenever the uh, enterprise earns sufficient profit but non cumulative preference share, uh, uh, preference dividend is of a exact contrary if there is insufficient insufficient profits in a particular financial year then such amount of preference dividend is not carried forward it is not necessary to be paid in the subsequent years so the company or the enterprise does not assume a liability for unpaid preference dividend of a particular year this is a peculiar nature of cumulative and non cumulative preference shares i know most of you 99.99% of the people who are watching this already know what these are i'm just repeating it now what is the peculiar change which applies in computation of paes the peculiar change is this that whenever i have preference dividend to the extent to the extent they belong to cumulative preference shares preference dividend has to be reduced from the profit after tax whether you have sufficient profits or not whether the dividends are declared or not i have to make sure that the preference dividend is reduced from my profit after tax but in the case of non cumulative preference shares i will reduce preference dividend from profit after tax only if such dividend is declared i'll repeat on cumulative preference shares i will reduce preference dividend from profit after tax to arrive at profits available to equity shareholders whether the dividend in the current year has been declared or not why did you do that because anyway the enterprise has a liability if not current year subsequent year i'll have to pay that preference dividend whenever i make sufficient profits when you assume going concern of the enterprise i'll assume that the enterprise will live for a longer period of time infinite life so why does it have infinite life because i'm assuming that some point of time in future i'll make profit why do you think flipkart was acquired by walmart at such a high price are it's a loss making entity why did they acquire because they assumed that flipkart can make profit in the subsequent years that is fundamentally what we are talking about therefore whether i have sufficient profits to declare dividend or not whether i have actually declared dividend or not i will have to reduce the preference dividend every year from profit after tax to arrive at profits available to equity shareholders if 
the preference shares in the enterprise are of cumulative nature. However, if the preference shares are non-cumulative in nature, then it is not necessary for us to deduct the preference dividend from profit after tax to arrive at profits available to equity shareholders. Why is that so? Because if I don't have sufficient profits, the preference dividend need not be declared or paid and even though they don't declare in the current year, there is no obligation for the enterprise to pay it in future when they make sufficient profits. That is the fundamental logic. But one more logic has to be inserted here. That one logic which has to be inserted here is the concept of accumulated preference dividend or arrears of preference dividend. The arrears of the past, past years, if the past year preference dividend was not paid, should I reduce again in the current year to make sure that I calculate uh, for the computation of profits available to equity shareholders. Let's say your preference dividend is 100 cumulative in nature. Last two years I did not pay. Areas of preference dividend is 200 shown as a contingent liability. Now I give you calculation of the, the numerator part PAS. How do you calculate? Profit after tax minus 100 current year preference dividend whether declared or not minus 200 areas of preference dividend should I reduce should I reduce areas of preference dividend I don't have to why don't you have to re re reduce it I don't have to reduce it because every year whether such dividend was paid or declared or not I made sure that there was a deduction in computation of EPS therefore those areas which you are talking about I have already considered them in that particular year for payment of, for a computation of EPS. Therefore, subsequently, when there is an areas of preference dividend, it need not be considered in computation of your numerator that is PAS. Therefore, the preference dividend to be reduced for computation of PAS is only the current year preference dividend. And if the preference shares are cumulative in nature, whether the dividend is declared or not, I will compulsory reduce preference dividend in determination of PAS. If they are non-cumulative in nature, I will reduce PAS from profit after tax only if such dividend is declared. Clear logic? Clear with this? Any doubts? Let me know guys. let's get into the last adjustment in pace profits available to equity shareholders now read that concept i'll tell you what exactly it means expenses and losses adjusted against reserves which otherwise would have been debited to p and should be 
deducted from profit after tax in computation of PAS. I'll repeat again. I said expenses or losses which have been adjusted against reserves, which otherwise would have been debited to PL, should be deducted from profit after tax in computation of PAS. What is this talking about? Does it make any sense? Let me try to take you through examples. Now let's look at this. Let's say for example, my profit after tax is let's say about 100. Okay. Let's say I had a certain amount of preliminary expenses to the extent of 5 rupees. I could have either written the entry as writing it off to PNL, PNL account debit 5 to preliminary expenses or I could also write it off against securities premium. I have two options because securities premium can be utilized for adjustment of your preliminary expenses. So either of these two I could have adopted. I could have either gone as per the first model or I could have gone as per the second. Either I could have written PNL to uh, preliminary expenses or I could have written securities premium to preliminary expenses. Let's say for example, this particular enterprise have issued shares at a premium. So therefore, there was a securities premium already existing under reserves and surplus. Therefore, this preliminary expenses got adjusted against the securities premium and have not been debited to PNL. Such kind of expenses which have been adjusted to reserve, here it is securities premium, which otherwise would have been adjusted to PNL should be reduced in determination of PAS. Therefore, this should be reduced by 5 and 95 is your PAS for computation of EPS. For computation of EPS, I will consider it as 95. Sir, PNL is showing 100. I agree. But the PNL is showing 100 because such kind of preliminary expenses which should have been debited to PNL has now been debited to securities premium uh, or adjust against securities premium instead. Such kind of expenses and losses which otherwise would have been adjusted to PNL should be reduced or should be considered in computation of PAS. Similar logic you have under India's 36 impairment as well. If you remember impairment logic, impairment of an asset, the impairment loss should be debited to PNL. Therefore, I should write the entry as impairment account debit to asset and PNL account debit to impairment. However, if the asset was upward revalued earlier, then in such case, there is a revaluation reserve already existing and such impairment loss should be written off against revaluation surplus. So instead of writing PNL to impairment, I will write revaluation surplus to impairment. So if that revaluation surplus was not there, this impairment would have been debited to PNL. So an expense or a loss which has been written off or adjusted against a reserve in the financials otherwise would have been adjusted to PNL, which otherwise would have been adjusted to PNL, should be adjusted or should be deducted in computation of PAS. Look at the examples that he gives. I gave you two examples already. So let's see the other examples. Impairment loss adjusted against revaluation surplus, preliminary expenses or loss on issue of debentures adjusted against securities premium. So in both of these cases, you can either be preliminary expenses or loss on issue of debentures or redemption of issue uh, of, of debentures at a premium. Such losses can be written off against securities premium. So if there was no securities premium, I would have directly debited it to PNL. 
so which otherwise would have been debited to PNL should be adjusted in determination of PAS. Now read the sentence once again, it will make full sense. An expense or a loss which has been adjusted from a reserve otherwise would have been adjusted or debited to PNL should be deducted from PAT profit after tax to arrive at the computation of PAS. This is the logic. Clear? This is the last adjustment as far as the numerator is concerned. That is profits available to equity shareholders. Again, any doubts? Let me know. Now that will bring us to the end of the discussion on the numerator part that is profits available to equity shareholders where we have seen particularly the formula of PAS is equal to profit after tax minus preference dividend. In determination of profit after tax I gave you one adjustment. What is the adjustment which I told you? Any expense or loss which has been adjusted to a reserve otherwise would have been debited to PNL should be deducted in computation of profit after tax for determining PAS. I have given you examples for this. Regarding preference dividend being reduced, I gave you two cases. I said for cumulative preference shares, I will reduce the preference dividend whether the dividend is declared or not. Therefore, sometimes even if I don't have sufficient profits to declare preference dividend, I will reduce preference dividend in computation of PAS. However, in case of non-cumulative preference shares, I will reduce preference dividend for computation of PAS only if the dividend has been declared. Now, simple question before, before I go into the denominator is, can PAS be negative? Yes or no? Answer is yes. How can PAS be negative? No problem, man. Who said profit after tax is always a profit? There could also be a loss. So therefore, your PAT itself could be a negative figure. But let's say your PAT is a, prof, is a positive figure, even in such cases, if your preference dividend on cumulative preference shares is more than the profit after tax, there is every possibility that your PAS could be negative. Profits after tax is 15. Cumulative preference dividend is 50. Then what will happen? Your PAS is minus 35. Therefore, there could be possibly a negative figure if in case your preference dividend is more than the amount of profit after tax in case those preference shares are cumulative in nature. Clear? So there could possibly be a case where a PAS could be a negative figure either in case your PAT is negative or in case if your PAT is positive but is less than the amount of dividend on cumulative preference shares. Clear? Now, if I go with the earlier formula that we have seen, what is the formula of EPS that we have seen? PAS divided by WNES. Profits available to equity shareholders. If the numerator itself is negative, then there is every possibility that your EPS is also negative. Yes, your EPS can definitely be negative. So, therefore, in some situations, you might come across enterprises which has and negative EPS. All famous companies that you find around the world, Uber, Amazon, Flipkart, all these people have been reporting a negative EPS all throughout in their life. Okay, so these companies have not come into profits yet, but they have a potential of earning profit. That's why you find that their market prices are high. Okay, so fundamentally, I can tell you one simple logic 
that there could be a situation where an enterprise could report a negative basic EPS. Now let's come into the denominator part that is WNES weighted average number of equity shares. How do I calculate this denominator part that is weighted average number of equity shares? Simple logic. Number of shares outstanding at the beginning of the period. Number of shares outstanding at the beginning of the period adjusted by shares issued or bought back during the period multiplied by a time waiting factor. I'll repeat what I said. I said number of shares at the beginning of the period adjusted by shares issued. Shares issued, what will happen to the number of shares at, at the beginning of the period will be added or shares which are bought back. Therefore, the number of shares will reduce minus. So plus or minus shares issued or shares bought back during that particular period multiplied by their time waiting factor. What is your time waiting factor? Time waiting factor is number of days for which specific number of shares are outstanding during the period divided by the total number of days during the period. So I'm saying a time waiting factor is number of days for which specific number of shares are outstanding during the period divided by the total number of days during the period. That will give me time waiting factor TWF. This is my computation of weights. Here I said number of equity shares outstanding at the beginning of the period adjusted by plus or minus shares issued plus or shares bought back minus during that particular period multiplied by time waiting factor. The time waiting factor is the number of days for which specific number of shares are outstanding during the period divided by the total number of shares during the period or total number of days during the period. Let's try to apply this. Okay, let's try to apply this first of all. I hope you can see this question right up, up on your screen. I hope everyone can see this question right on your screens. Yep, look at it. Now these are illustrations for India's 33, which were normally given by ICI to explain how the standard actually applies. So he is giving you a small illustration and saying that the balance at the beginning of the period is 1800. On 31st May, the number of shares issued for cash is 600. 1st November, shares bought back are 300. And finally, 31st December, at the end of the year, it is 2100 shares. This is a simple illustration given to you. And all that you have to do is calculate weighted average number of equity shares. I will calculate this in two ways. Okay. I will tell you what are the defects in each method, but I will calculate the same thing in two ways. Let's see. So I'm looking at computation of WNES. Weighted average number of equity shares. So this is the first method and this is the second method. Let's see how I calculate. First method, okay. How many shares were there at the beginning? 1800. How many shares were issued after that? 600. How many shares were what back? 1800 shares over entire 12 months. When were those 600 shares issued? Those 600 shares were issued on uh, 31st May. And when were they bought back? 1st November. So I'm talking about a calendar year. So be specific. 31st May. I'm talking about number of months starting from 31st May. So June to December, June, July, August, September, October, November and December, seven months. 
300 bought back on 1st November. 1st November, that means basically I am only considering December, that is the, uh, sorry, November and December because it happened on 1st November. So what? 2 by 12. Calculate. This is 1800. This is 350 plus. And this is 50 minus. My answer is 2100. Same thing, I will try to calculate in a different way altogether. What is my different way? I'll come to that. Look at it. I had 1800 shares outstanding until 31st May, starting from 1st Jan. So 1st Jan to 31st May, that means for 5 months, I had 1800 shares outstanding. For 5 months, 5 by 12. After that, 600 shares were issued on 31st May. Therefore, the total number of shares became 2,400. So, the number of shares were 2,400 starting from 1st June up to 1st November. 1st June to 1st November, another 5 months, this number, so and so number of shares were outstanding. After the shares were bought back, the number of shares came down to 2,100. And these many number of shares were outstanding for the last two months. So 2 by 12. Calculate and check. 1800 into 5 by 12 is 750. And this is 1200. And this is 350. Total coming back to 2100. So I find that answer is exactly the same in both the ways. You calculate either in the first way or in the second way. My answer of weighted average number of shares is absolutely the same. But I will tell you something. This part which I represented out here. This is wrong. Why is it wrong? Now go back to what the formula says. Now go back to what the formula says. The formula is saying that number of equity shares at the beginning of the period adjusted by number of shares issued or bought back during the period. So first thing that there should be an adjustment for is the number of shares at the beginning should be adjusted by added by the shares issued or reduced by the shares bought back. Therefore, in a significant way, I can understand that this is wrong and this part is absolutely correct. However, I'll bring in with one more logic man. Please try to understand. Even though this is right, this is wrong. How is this wrong? Look at what is your time waiting factors. Your time waiting factors